All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we will, we'll start off with a topic, then we'll just meander like we normally do. I think Drew will show up eventually. I know uh, War Thunder or Warhammer, or whatever his name is. Um, War said Thunder, he, yeah. Yeah, he's, he said he'd be around eventually to defend his precious Linux Mint. Uh, <laughs> if he shows up before we move on to other topics, he can do so. Um, if not, then he'll just have to live with me calling it a useless distro. <laughs> I would not go that far at all. I That's, did go that far. <laughs> I I said I would not. <laughs> no, besides, to me, you know, Susie's always got that title locked up. Oh, ban <laughs> ban that man, ban. It. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should say that I've actually I actually downloaded the Open Susie DVD. I'm gonna. I I'm gonna wouldn't go up. there. I wouldn't go that far either. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely not for me. Nope. I hate the Windows workflow, but... Same here. Jerry, you should be the one using OpenSUSE. You live next to a mirror. Zipper would be <laughs> fast for you. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am seeding Fedora ISOs. You're probably using a, probably using a <clears throat> mirror from the United States. <laughs> no. no they, they probably do have E ones. Uh, for whatever reason, it's just OpenSUSE that doesn't like to do... Uh, mirrors in places mm, yeah i i never use the german mirrors because i i know how bad germany's internet infrastructure is and therefore the servers are slow as shit all right i'm not gonna require people raise their hands you can raise your hand if you want to but seeing as how there's so few of us we'll just go ahead and chat uh if, if you're muted and you want to talk Raising hand may get yourself noticed. Uh, otherwise, you can just listen along like normal. Uh, but other than that, we'll just... We'll yes, just speaking of man. Area on the others, yep. Drew. The man, the myth. All right. That's the the out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> may, may not be out of focus. May just be just doing frozen. his thing. <laughs> All right. Dan Debian. So... Who here wants to defend Linux Mint first? That's just anybody want to say Linux Mint is the best distro ever? No, I'll never say that. Okay, good. Then we can just move on. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just I just would not categorize it as useless. Okay, it's I, th I think it has its place. I think there's a lot of people that would like it. It would be it would work for them, especially you know as they get into it. I don't you know. Especially it's not horrible for people coming from Windows. Yeah, that, that's one of the its biggest selling points. It's easy to use for people coming from Windows. Yeah. I think it's better than Ubuntu. It doesn't have snaps. It has Flatpak by default. Uh, it has like uh, a nice little pop up that opens up when you install it that tells you about time shift and other good stuff it should know about. Uh, it has like an auto updater thing in the taskbar. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like a slightly improved Ubuntu and there's an LMD version that's on Debian that looks pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and they have multiple choices of desktop. So like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, but I never really tried it because it's, you know, it's for new users, but I think it's useful for new users yeah. probably. Yeah. I mean, that, some of the people that have used it definitely have, better than Ubuntu, you know, have found that things just worked. You know, their printers showed up and, you know, they didn't have to spend a lot of time. <clears throat> and I think those hurdles are important if there's not someone there to kind of guide them through it. But let, let me play the bad guy here. I'm really good <laughs> at it. Um, I don't have a problem with Cinnamon. I think it's a fantastic desktop environment, and that's basically what Linux Mint is. It's, it's Ubuntu with a Cinnamon desktop on top of it, and they pulled snaps out, right? So that's basically what we're talking about here. I don't have a problem with the desktop environment at all. I think it's very, very good. I think, like Trollbus said, that it's very, you know, or someone else said, it's, it's very good for people who come from Windows. I don't think that it is is unique in that regard at least not anymore maybe it was first i don't i don't i don't really think that it was first but whatever you know it's there and, and it's fine right my problem has always been not that it's a bad distro but that their uh, their attention is 
separated on two different distros and maintaining them. It, it, it would be like, um, I mean, we all make, you know, we all, we have all claimed, or at least on the podcast, we've claimed that the Arco developers are very scattered when it comes to their attention. They have a whole bunch of desktop environments and window managers and all the place, but at least you can say it's all based on the same distro. You can't say that with Linux Mint. It's actually based on two different distros. That means they have to do deal with two separate collections of repositories, two separate ISOs, and not only two separate ISOs, but each of those ISOs has multiple desktop environments associated with them, so they, each, they have ISOs for each of those desktop environments. And add on top of, of, of that, they have different release cycles, different developers that they have to deal with in order to mess around with upstream, all of this stuff goes to say is that they, they, their level of hate on for Ubuntu is obvious. They've taken Ubuntu and taken everything out of it that makes Ubuntu Ubuntu. Everything, except for the repositories, you know. <laughs> and they basically made it into Debian, which they already have a Debian edition. So my complaint with them has always been that they have two separate ways of doing things and they should really just fo pick one and go forth it'd be much easier um uh, go ahead jerry yeah that's my that that's also my opinion about linux mint they should drop the ubuntu version the, it's totally clear they really do not like ubuntu so stop maintaining an ubuntu version and just go with debian instead I mean, even the Ubuntu version, I don't like to compare with Ubuntu, but Debian instead, because it's more like Debian in that regard. And, yeah. Well, and it would be additive, right? So they'd be taking Debian and adding their stuff to it, making the, their stuff on top of it. So they'd be adding their tools. Like, you know, MX Linux does Spiral Linux. They take Debian and add on to it and make it better. Right. Whereas with Ubuntu, they have to take all of the stuff that makes Ubuntu, take it out, and then add stuff on top of it. It's a whole extra step. War Thunder, go ahead and defend your precious Linux Mint. <laughs> I was going to say my name was called. Yeah. Um, well, I actually agree with Jerry. I, I've so I started on the Ubuntu version probably about two and a half years ago, um, and while done, you know, I have my wife on it now too, and as well, this the laptop I'm on has it on there, but. I will say, if I have to reload this laptop for any reason at all, the only reason I haven't is because I'm lazy. Um, but if I have to reload it at all, I've been using the Debian edition. Um, I've even trained myself how to do NVIDIA drivers. I have a precision back here that I edit my own YouTube videos on. It runs the NVIDIA Optimus. I figured out the Primus, the Bumblebee packages, and learned all that stuff. But, you know, I'm a few years down the road. I've started to learn things about packaging formats and NVIDIA drivers. And, you know, it's not as terrible as it once was. But I appreciated Mint's getting me up and over that hurdle because it did all the hard stuff for me up front. And then as I could learn, I still have a usable system, but as I could learn, I could get more comfortable with things and whatnot. He does. Go ahead and move my way. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what my only counterpoint was. There are things in the Ubuntu ecosystem for proprietary drivers and so forth that are basically baked in. And your average new person isn't going to have as good of an experience with a Debian based one if they've got NVIDIA or they've got, you know, weird Broadcom, you know, Wi Fi drivers. So <clears throat> I totally get what you're saying about this kind of diversified portfolio and the effort that it takes. But unfortunately, you know, with Debian there are some there are some drawbacks. You know, it is harder to do some things out of the box. So now, now having said that, I mean, if they decide to go that way, then yeah, they're going to pick up the task <laughs> of dealing with the NVIDIAs and the Broadcoms and the Codex and everything else on their own. And that may be the smarter move. But I think <clears throat> for the time, that is just 
probably the easier path. Well, they they already do a lot of that stuff already, though, because they have to take everything that Ubuntu has packaged as a snap and maintain the alternative dev, dev uh, you know dev packages for those things. They've already done it with like, Chromium and Firefox and, and a couple of other mm -hmm. things. So they they they're on that path already. It just feels from, and I've argued this for years, and they're obviously, I, I think that it's obvious that eventually LMD is where they're going. Like, they're I gonna, agree. Like, they're going to do it. Yeah. My argument is just. I like, think Ubuntu is going full snappy in the following 10 years. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to even take them 10 years. I mean, they already have Ubuntu <laughs> Core or whatever. It's going to, it's going it, to, this is, the, the full snap thing is going to happen very, very fast once they get it up and running. Look, I mean, look how fast, uh, you know, silver blue and stuff like that have been developed over the course of the last two or three years that's happened you know like yeah and yes fedora hasn't gone and made like silver blue the default thing but you, you know you can tell that that stuff has more and more influenced fedora as well so i i think that for me just rip the band-aid off and and do it but also but you gotta remember i'm not a district maintainer so i understand that there's more to it than that so war thunder go ahead I was going to say is my last comment. Yeah, there there is a lot the Ubuntu version does that Debian doesn't yet. But here here's how I've put it: the Ubuntu version is still, I think, great for the new user because a lot of the things are done for you out of the box. It's what I would call the easy mode. Yeah, I've almost moved on from that point because when I started using Linux, I didn't even know what an NVIDIA graphics driver was, and I wondered why my system crashed all the time because at that time, Novu was not very good. Um, as graphics cards have advanced, I figured out that Novu is not terrible anymore, actually, if you have a newer card. But I've moved on from that point. I know how to install the Broadcom drivers myself. Through many painful experiences, yes, but I've, I've figured it out. I've figured out how to do the NVIDIA drivers. I've figured out how to do these power management tools and whatnot and to get my system the way I want it through scripts that I've written and whatnot. So right now, the Ubuntu version is easy mode to me. And LMDE is, I'm the more advanced user now. I'm the intermediate user. I don't necessarily want Arch, where I have to tinker on things all the time, but I don't necessarily need everything laid out for me anymore. I can kind of figure out things myself. Yeah. And there, there is a side issue of, you know, Debian does lag behind on libraries and versions and all kinds of things. You know, so that, I mean... That that too is is a bit of a downside to to Debian, and I'm and I'm running a Debian system here right now. You know, I like it very much, so I'm not down on Debian at all. Well, if that was the argument, then why is Linux Mint based on Ubuntu LTS? Because Ubuntu LTS literally is the same thing. Yes, they started updating the mm -hmm. kernel and Mesa packages here and there, but the the core repo, except for those packages I mentioned earlier, is still at that fixed point and will never get any updates. So in that being right, said... But, but you know that the next version of it, now that, <clears throat> that Ubuntu LTS is out, they're going to go to it. <clears throat> and then you make yeah. a nice jump. You yeah. get to 12... And you're still behind, and it's going to be a while before the next one is actually released from Debian. It's always going to be behind. Well, <clears throat> at the same time, when Linux Mint 22 drops, the packages are already at least four or five months behind for the Ubuntu version. And also, let's let's say they scrap it, the release cycle would stay kind of the same. Plus, minus three, four, five months, maybe, yes. But Debian releases every two years, around, roughly. Ubuntu releases every two years. And if Debian needs one or two months more time to release Debian Trixie, for example then it's totally fine. It's not like they absolutely have to release every two years. True. Don't forget to um, unmute yourself. There's a, there's a benefit to using LTS versions. I, I mean, I'm going to pile on for a second and say that um, the Linux Mint and Debian edition, I would 
I would say that that's the, the move here because you're actually Linux Mint and Debian are both community driven operating systems, you know, <clears throat> both them, both distros as opposed to, you know, canonical and Ubuntu. So I wish they would just package on their, you know, package the two community versions, you know, and that would make a lot more sense. However, I'm not afraid of the older software at this point. You know, I, to your point, it's like, okay, big deal. You know, I, I don't really care if Debian right now is in the middle of a cycle and we've got 12 months more for it to, you know, to get to Trixie. I don't care. You know, I guess maybe there is some benefit to updating the kernel. I guess maybe, I don't know what the next, Dubs, did you tell me that the next, the kernel on Ubuntu was like 6.8? eight at this point or eight yeah and that's not i mean that's 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 really good but at the same time i mean i'm running six one and i don't really feel like i'm lagging behind at all either so you know well, there, there, there is an argument for a newer kernel when your focus is on brand new users who may have more up-to-date hardware than some people but i mean there are ways of getting around it i mean you there are a lot of alternative Debian-based distros that push out a you know a more up-to-date kernel. I'm, I'm testing one right now for a video in the next couple of days called Neptune that pushes a more up-to-date kernel comes directly from testing and it, you know yeah it's freak it's Frank and Debian but you know it, if they if they're the ones maintaining it it, it would work fine. Uh, but I just want to admit that my I have eternal shame right now because I'm I'm staring at the screen and it just hit me. Drew, your icon has the Debian logo in it. I had no fucking clue. <laughs> Like I, I had no clue. Wow. It's just I, standing there, and it's like, it's. It, it, what's wrong with me? <laughs> well, I I thought that's common knowledge. No. I <laughs> I saw that immediately. <laughs> yeah, I think I did it one of the last times too. Just, yeah. yeah, just really quick. I'm not just talking about the kernel. That is that is a, a definite issue, especially on newer hardware. But I also mean all the packages, the versions of programs. You want to run, you know, <clears throat> lazy Vim. Oh, well, guess what? The, what comes with Debian is too old. You want to run, you know, something else. It's too old. Let me ask I you a question, start, you know, though, D-Dubs. When was the last time you knew of a, of a brand new to Linux user who cared one job about? And, no, I... From from a Debian pers from a, like a, a a kernel perspective makes sense a driver perspective makes sense because you need newer things for newer hardware right but you use the example of lazy them do new users really particularly care I mean uh, about version numbers on that kind of stuff well except that when they you know when they get on you know Discord or forums and they want to try something you know or you know they see a video oh that looks really cool. Mm. And I'm not saying I mean the day one, but as as they progress, that's all. <clears throat> it's just a, it's just an issue. It is it's just a limiting issue. Yeah, War Thunder, go ahead. I was going to say real shortly, um, not a fix for everything, but at least if you can get Debian or LMDE to boot on like the six one kernel, like it is right now, they enable Debian backports out of the box. They just don't install anything from it. So if you need a newer kernel, there are newer kernels in backports that you can pull forward. I'm sure there's tutorials online for it. They just don't yet have the kernel manager there. But yeah. I would like to think that Mint would would backport their other tooling and whatnot to the Debian edition if they moved in that direction anyway. I'm I'm sure it wouldn't be that much trouble for them to do it. Jerry? And... Also, DDubs, when it comes to let let's stick to lazy vim. How how many people who are freshly coming to Linux are developers who would like to use lazy vim? Not I mean, a so lot. That was just so, an example that I thought of. It. There are other yeah, packages yeah, out there that they're going to want to use that they're not going to be able to use. Well, let, let's use something more up to date and this one actually may eventually be a, an issue right because eventually uh gimp will stop pulling our leg and pull out 3.0 out of the hat and we'll we'll, we'll all celebrate pigs will fly mm -hmm. 
and, and all, all the things that you you know all the things that you promised to do you'll end up having to do because you you, you said you're not going to do it until get free to oh you know actually hits let's say that happens right that's a situation where i could actually see like right because regular people use use yeah. gimp right and then they look at gimp 3.0 which is going to be miraculous it's going to replace photoshop for everyone all these promises <laughs> that they've absolutely made i mean i hear Brody robertson telling it's going to change his life um <laughs> yeah that happens and, and you know eventually somebody's gonna look well you know what i can't actually get this but there's a, a big counter argument to this. That's why flat packs exist, right? That, that's where everything is supposed to be going is the containerized packages. And you, at least in theory, the, the Linux Mint developers could say, yes, we have an older version of GIMP in the repositories. If you want to use that because it's more stable, you can do so. If not, point people towards the flat pack. Drew, go ahead. Well, 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 well. Um, Hold on a second, the... Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, go ahead. I look at it. I mean, I guess the question is: Is Cinnamon the best transition point for everybody? Because that's where I think Linux Mint has its benefit too. But I, you know, I saw recently that Ubuntu Cinnamon came out. Obviously, it has. It's really pretty. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, can you make an argument that Ubuntu Cinnamon is every bit as good as Linux Mint for newer users? That's my question. Well, my answer to that is that there would be no Cinnamon without Linux Mint because the, the Mint guys develop Cinnamon. So Yeah, 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 yeah I'm saying, which is better, though. I mean, if you're, if, you know... Yeah. I think the overall packaging of Linux Mint is better than anything out of Ubuntu. I think out of Canonical. As far as being everything is as close as you can get to kind of you install it and, and most things are going to work. But your is printers, Cinnamon the transition your... point that we need for new users coming from Windows? Yeah, because that's what a, a, if someone lived on Windows and they knew nothing else, they expect pretty much when they plug their printer in, it works. Or then when they plug in, you know, their drive, it works. Oh, look, it pops up on my screen, whatever. They're used to things just kind of working what, what then wouldn't the argument then be just to use ubuntu i mean i mean and, and most of them do like that i i think i mean we don't have hard numbers but still it seems like the vast majority of people who are going to come to linux probably start on an ubuntu and maybe they eventually go to linux mint the, the argument between ubuntu and regular linux mint isn't that one is a better Ubuntu than the other, because most new users don't care about one using snaps, one using flat packs, mm -hmm. whatever. Exactly. They don't. They don't care, right? What they're looking at instead is the UI, which is where Cinnamon actually comes in because it looks like Windows, whereas Ubuntu, you know, does not. Uh, Jerry, I'm sorry, I cut you off earlier. Go ahead. <laughs> You're fine. Um, yeah, but then the thing is, let's stick to the example with GIMP. That's a great example and yeah there are flat packs then but a new user wouldn't know the difference between a dead package a flat pack a snap an app image even because of one thing they if they come from windows they only know two formats exe and some of them know the msi format and the thing is they they both basically work the same way and debian for example is ki it feels like they are more like no app images flat pack snaps are bad you should only use our repos and nothing else and that's a thing that could be a blocker it's easy to install flat pack but the user would have to know it well, and that, that's not that's not true at all though jerry because a lot of distros make that choice for people because the vast mm -hmm. majority of people aren't going into the terminal and saying flat pack install whatever they're going into get them software or whatever it is that cinnamon has right. and and what the, exactly. the mint guys could do is just default to flat pack for those packages that they know <laughs> they want to distribute through flat pack instead of the, the i mean they, it'd be very easy for them to make that type of decision for the users because they're 
their are their audience is new users and making that decision for them wouldn't be you know out of line and it wouldn't be as if if you wanted the debian package you couldn't just go up into that little drop down or whatever and make that choice you know so I mean, it would require a little bit of repository management on their end to make those type of decisions, uh, you know, on a package by package basis, if that's what they want to do, or they could just go flat pack totally by default in the in the software store, and that would save them a lot of actual work when it comes to maintaining things like Firefox, like Chromium, and stuff like that. They could just use the flat pack instead of the the problem I have, and I've talked about this, and even just now tonight, is, is that they have this weird sense. The Mint guys seems to have this weird sense that they always have to do everything themselves. You know, it, it doesn't matter if something that, that they're doing already exists. They have to do their own version of it. Um, and some some of that stuff is with is with good reason, right? The Debian and stuff they want didn't want to use the snaps. Like they wanted to do that. That's fine, but it feels like they would resist going flat pack only because they would have more control over the debian go ahead jerry and uh, troll bus go ahead then um yeah uh i was wondering is that default what even is a default because i remember installing linux mint on someone's laptop and kind of like explaining the drop down and pick the dev, the dev version by default um, um to like a new user, because I know like the, the sandbox, I had a lot of problems with it, so I, I stopped using Flatpak long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, so I was kind of explained it, but I, I kind of uh, forgot uh, uh, if it's even the default already. War Thunder, you can answer uh, well, that. I don't know if there's anyone that knows uh, Linux Mint. Uh, Most of, uh, from, from what I have seen, I believe if it, so if the software manager recognizes two apps of the same, like GIMP, I believe it tends to default to the flat pack instead of the deb. But if you're searching for the software, it shows you both, but it's quite clear this is a flat pack and this is a deb. Yeah, that's not confusing at all. D dubs, go ahead. Yeah, just gonna say my only thing with flat packs has been some having some having to use flat seal to get it to work properly. <clears throat> which is gonna be confusing for a new user. That's that's and the other one is is yeah. the theming, because it totally Oh, okay. <laughs> most of the time disrespects the theming of the so, system so but i've been told by george castro that the theming issue is just in our brains so that apparently is fixed uh, i i i don't think that it's fixed but i th i think that it's fixed in gnome which is where george lives okay and i can believe not, that it's not fixed everywhere else so like if you use if you're in hyperland and you open up a flat pack that thing is going to come out at way to white guaranteed yep. right like it doesn't it doesn't matter if you have lx appearance or whatever the the wayland version of it is right it's going to come out white and wg uh, bar yep our uh, nwg look Gnome has theming yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, or, or even like i say in, in nix with stylix or or any of the theming mm -hmm. stuff it just completely ignores it yeah it's it yeah, yeah. so so it has some there's something special that Gnome does to get flat packs to actually follow the theme. Whatever that magic sauce is, no one else knows. Jerry, go ahead. Well, about the Linux Mint software store, I just remembered one thing that they should stop doing then. And, and that's um, that weird, I like to call it, Linux Mint flat hub selection. It's basically what Fedora did back in the day. And now Linux Mint does that. In, and if you don't activate a toggle in the settings, you won't get any flat packs that are not verified by its developers. And let's say, for example, Google Chrome is not officially supported and verified by its developer. So you will not, you won't have a way out of the box to install Google Chrome using the software store. Well, I mean that's, that's... More, more of a of a of a flat hub verification problem pro problem where it's just a mess. Like anybody anybody can get verification even if not not really the developer of the program. So I mean, you, you can, so they've just basically taught people that you can't trust the verification on flat hub. I think from what I hear, they're fixing that. But once you lose trust on verification stuff, it's mm. it's like it'd be like everyone all of a sudden trusting the blue checks on Twitter again. Like it's just it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Well, the the issue was they used to say verified, 
and people were thinking, oh, okay, this is a tested, verified app, but it wasn't. Now it's like approved or something or not. They, they've changed the status. They didn't fix anything. It's not any yeah, better. They just changed yeah, the word. But, they just changed but, the word so that it's not leading you to believe that this is a verified, tested, safe product like you get on, you know, the Apple store, that you get on, you know, Google store, you know, whatever. Yes. But there's been, go ahead. Here's my my thing, that, my opinion that they should make the setting that makes the unverified flat packs appear and disappear opt out then. Because if you are on an unverif on the page for an unverified app, you get told, hey, look, that's not an officially supported version of the app. Please be cautious. And well, why why make it opt in the, then? Because then it f for a new user at least. I had I had it very recently with a friend of mine who tried Linux Mint, and he was like, "You guys have no software whatsoever. Why?" Because the software store didn't show anything. Well, I mean, Elementary OS had the exact same problem because they did the same thing, right? But right. I, I think that. And what's funny though is if you're coming from like Mac OS, you probably are more used to having that opt in thing because in order to install software from outside of the store, you have to change it. Drew, go ahead. I'm going to ask a really dumb question. If someone sell me that Cinnamon is better for new users than Mate or a configured XFCE? Hey. Yes and no. It highly depends on how, in what way it's configured. Because, well, if you're coming from Windows again, then Cinnamon is basically like uh, I. I know it's n it's not a hundred percent, but it's very close to like Windows Seven. Yeah, but that's a, and that's the same friends. kind of feel more than XFCE does, and you know, I mean, it's not Ubuntu, but you know. Hey, you know, XFC, nothing's as good as Ubuntu. XFCE, on the other hand, feels more like Windows XP. So if if one likes win the aesthetic of Windows XP, then XFCE could be a better option. You can make XFCE look however you want. Absolutely. No, absolutely that, no one's going to go on there and say, use vanilla XFC, because we've all seen that garbage. Yeah. I, like, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but I, I, th I, I, think, I think the thing here is that Cinnamon is basically the Windows paradigm. That's the way they've designed it, right? Where everything else would have to be made to look that way. So, like, like for example, Zorin does the exact same thing with GNOME and XFC, but they've taken those desktop environments and made them into GNOME, right? Where, whereas, like, Cinnamon is... is is already that way because they've already done the work on it. So if Mint were, Mint were to say switch to GNOME, they'd have to do the work again. Um, oh, I mean, it's not it, it's not as if it's really all that hard. It's just a couple of extensions, right? But I, I think that the way I look at Cinnamon is that it's basically GNOME because it will use GNOME extensions and stuff. But it, it's like a more modern, less GNOME GNOME. If if that makes any sense, it doesn't have the the Prigadelios that that GNOME has it has more customizability. It has more you know settings and and, and applets and extensibility and stuff than than GNOME, GNOME has at least out of the box. And you could actually argue then that that would be a reason why it wouldn't be good for new users because it does offer more, I think, breakability because it does have more settings and stuff like that. But I think when it all boils down to it, it's simply the look and feel when people say cinnamon is for new users is because it looks like windows that's i think that's the argument i don't know whether it's a good argument but that's that seems to be the argument yeah, yeah, yeah i did I, I I pretty well good. yeah i just thought mate is, is is every bit as good if you ask me i mean if you're talking about a new user i don't see how mate is any different than i mean because i think there's less Less settings is not a bad thing in this case for a new user. I think the not even I think the difference though is with I'm just Linux trying to Mint fuck with people. isn't just <laughs> the 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 interface, it's everything that they've packaged around it that works. That is one thing I, I've always said that was good about elementary is 
what they gave you worked. They didn't give you everything, but what is there works. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's talk about elementary OS for a second, because there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between uh, Mint and elementary. I mean, similar release schedules, at least when elementary OS actually, you know, does a release. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's dead, <laughs> dead at this point. But at one point, elementary was every two years, like Mint was. It, it, Mint, like elementary, has a very similar, like, we want things to look like they all fit in with everything else. You, you, they have a, 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 a their own theming and stuff like that. It's supposed to go this direction, and, and, and they've done work to make sure that things look the same. Going so far as to basically just say, we're not doing libadwita at all. We're just going to support, you know, what GGK3 forever and ever and ever um and, you know and, and you know elementary had the same thing where they had a design language they kind of wanted to follow and uh, i i think that there's a lot of pair uh, with the flat packs they, they both chose to only support flat packs up to a certain verification level you know where well i guess, I guess with elementary originally they weren't doing it that way instead they just were hosting their own flat packs and that really significantly you know lowered the number of things that were in their store but um so I think that there's a lot of parallels there between Mint and Flat and Elementary OS. The only big difference is, is that Mint has stayed basically very steadily developed over the course of the years, whereas Elementary is, you know, not. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, that's that's the thing I actually find sad about Elementary OS. If Elementary OS had more regular releases and not like this release is like LTS comes out and then immediately the new elementary OS version comes out and the next one is like you could skip an entire LTS release because they take so long then I would say Linux Mint is basically perfect if you're coming from Windows and elementary OS is basically perfect if you're coming from Mac OS because the apps and everything it, everything looks so integrated on elementary os and also on linux mint it's just awesome but linux mint they release new versions it's fine but elementary os is that ba bad part with the release cycle that well yeah they've, really... they've got some real trouble financial yeah. trouble and yeah, they're 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 in trouble. So, been and been in trouble for a long time. A long time to, yeah. to to the point where it feels like people keep telling me that oh, elementary OS is still being developed, and like, mm, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, not. Not unless somebody forks it and picks it up. Oh, I mean, they they, 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 they there's there's like one person who like works like one day a week and pushes a few things up to their GitHub every once in a while just to make it look like the lights are still on in the house. Uh, War Thunder, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, if I was drawing a parallel between the two, because I have somebody, I have messed around with elementary OS and whatnot, and yeah, they both do try to provide a curated experience with their own desktop environments and whatnot. Um, and like, one of the biggest things about Mint, well, it doesn't move very quickly. I mean, obviously, elementary moves a lot slower than, than Mint in that regard, but a lot of the features are based around what the community around Mint wants, not necessarily what's the latest fad or what the latest thing that's in the Linux space is. So yeah, the community came back here uh, around Mint 21 and said, we want to start doing Wayland support because we're one of the last on the bandwagon. And so what did the Mint team do? They sat and thought about it and said, well, while we're working on it, why don't we just enable the experimental session? If you want to play around with it, you can play around with it. It's experimental. And then we'll start working on the back end and start merging in those changes. So we'll steadily get better. They came out with a roadmap. They said, we're going to do this and that. Um, you know, years and years ago, they decided, you know what, we're going to have extensions like GNOME. And so then they added extensions that the users want and then left it open to the community to say, hey, if you want to make your own extensions, here's how you make them. Um, and they've done that for applets, desklets, extensions. <laughs> The right-click actions menu was one of the latest ones, which is cool. You can create your own right-click menu items and stuff. Um, but it's all stuff the community wants, not necessarily um, what the what some corporation wants, right? It's a community distro. Um, and I even look at stuff like the kernel. 
you know, in mid-22, they're no longer going to ship whatever kernel the LTS launched with. They're just going to ship what Ubuntu is shipping for a kernel. So if Ubuntu updates the kernel, Mint updates the kernel. And that was a complaint that people have had for years is, well, like this machine I had for years until last year sometime, I was on the 5.15 kernel. I still have systems around here on 5.15 because it works. And I don't touch it because it works. Um, This one, I did update the kernel. So I could have some newer drivers. I was having some issues or whatnot. But it was easy to do that. And they provided the tools to let me do that. Let me argue against myself here for a minute. So my argument was that they should just choose the Debian edition. Let's just say instead they go the other direction. Say we're going to kill the Debian edition off and we're just going to go Ubuntu. Maybe maybe that's the way that they want to go. Maybe that's... The, I, I, it feels like they're having lovers' remorse. The, they're they're cheating. They're <laughs> cheating on Ubuntu, but they still love Ubuntu, so they don't want to leave Ubuntu, and they're just dragging it along until eventually the divorce happens. But you know, or maybe they can get some marriage counseling, and then the mistress goes away. That was a horrible metaphor, but it worked. It worked. I swear. The the, the thing is, is that the way you describe it, War Thunder, it makes it sound like they've put a lot of effort into making Ubuntu work for them. You know, they've pulled out snaps, you know, they're, go- they're going to follow along with, with the Ubuntu kernel, which makes a lot of sense, because that's what Pop! OS did. Where's Nate when you need him? I'm surprised you didn't just pop up out of the woodwork when I mentioned Pop! OS. Um, uh, <laughs> anyways, you know, like, like so so that's a, that's a big deal, and that's not something that they could do <coughs> as easily on Debian, because they'd have to pull that straight from a different repository instead of just basically following along you know they'd have to use the they'd have to pull out you know pull out a step you know testing or whatever you know they could do it it just would be a different process and they they, you know it, it feels like mint has some interesting ideas when it comes to making their distro work for them my argument has always just been like, yeah, why, why then, if, if they're doing all this work to make Ubuntu work for them, you know, they're pulling off snaps, doing all this stuff, and, and they've done a really good job. Like, 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 by all intents and purposes, Ubuntu version of Linux Mint is very, very good, and their users, every Linux Mint user that I've ever talked to said, Linux Mint is awesome. I've never heard of a Linux Mint user who said, this thing is trash, I'm going somewhere else. You know, I'm sure that they exist, but they're they're no longer using Linux Mint, I don't talk to those people. They're probably using Arch or something. Um, but, you, you know, so... They've obviously done a really good job of this of this Ubuntu version. Then why then why is the Debian thing there? Is it just really just a backup to Ubuntu in case Ubuntu really does screw them over? D Dubs, go ahead. I actually think in in a tangent tangent to that is I think either there's two warring developer groups at Mint, or I just thought of maybe they're trying to appease more people. Because there are definitely people who are anti Ubuntu. They want the you know, they want the the purity of Debian, you know, the community driven. And this is an answer to that. And the, it seems like they're willing to to spend the intellectual capital and and the time to to make it both of them work. And none of it makes any real sense. I agree with you know, pick one or the other ultimately. And you know, but I've never really cared which one they. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't care at all because I'm an OpenSUSE user. I'm going to be an OpenSUSE user for as long as OpenSUSE will have me. Um, but I, I have the thing is like Linux Mint offers a very good viable alternative for new users that Ubuntu doesn't because while well, Ubuntu has a whole bunch of flavors so you can choose if you want cinnamon you can get Ubuntu cinnamon if you want KDE or Mate or whatever you can get an Ubuntu version of that but they bury the flavors like like Kubuntu and and a lot of all the other flavors they're buried basically by the main flavor if, if you ask someone if they're using ubuntu you can almost count on the fact that they're using regular ubuntu chances are they're not going to be using one of the flavors because they have to go hunt they have to know those things exist in order to hunt them out so and, and what and what the differences are if you're new what you don't know what mate is versus cinnamon versus xfce kde mm-hmm. i mean well and and yeah, what's this unity crap you know like that existed like 10 years ago and now it's back you know 
Yeah, and default defaults matter. That you know, the default version of Ubuntu is the GNOME version of Ubuntu. The default version of Linux Mint is the Cinnamon version of. It. I would bet if you were to see metrics of how many people use the XSC and Mate version of Mints, they're significantly lower than the the ones that use the Cinnamon version. And that's just because defaults matter. It's just like it, it, it's different on like OpenSUSE, whereas OpenSUSE has one ISO and you choose your desktop during installation, right? I I. As, as an OpenSUSE user, I prefer that method. You can just choose what you want, but that's not going to be for everyone because not everybody w what he wants to download a six gigabyte ISO or download everything from the internet. So it's not the way everybody wants to do it. And that whole defaults matter thing is, is one of the reasons why the flavor thing for Ubuntu has never really made any sense to me because people are always just going to choose the regular version and then maybe eventually they'll get exposed to the flavors but that's going to be somewhere down the road the, the road it, it makes the new userness of the flavors much 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 less so I don't know worth under are you the only one here that actually uses Linux Mint on a daily driver I'm assuming uh, probably well and I was going to comment too like Maybe one of the reasons they still use the Ubuntu is because they haven't reached that point that the amount of work that it's taking them to rip out what they don't want and package what they do want hasn't reached the point where it would be easier for them to retool everything to Debian. And maybe that that's part of part of the thing. And I do think that Debian Edition was created because the community came out and said, we want a Debian Edition because Ubuntu is evil or something like that. Like, who knows? Well, I, think uh, I do think the community wanted it, and that's why it's there. Yeah. I will argue that I think the Debian Edition is almost as good as the Ubuntu Edition. You know, if a few more things would be pulled over, it would be just as good, and I would recommend it to anybody. Well, and you, you can also tell... Just back to my point of them seeing to know that they want to stay on Ubuntu, and your point earlier, War Thunder, is that they buried the LMD. LMD, like a, an Ubuntu flavor, is buried on their website. You have to know that it exists and go hunt it out. Uh, whereas if they thought that these things were equal, they'd both be on the front page, right? They'd be you know one side by side, but they're not. The, the main one is on the main page, and it's all there. And you can even find the various desktop flavors right alongside of each other when you're downloading yep. ISO, right? Where Man. the... LMD one's not there. Yeah, and I'd argue LMD isn't quite as a polished experience as the Ubuntu edition, but I mean, that makes sense, right? They're devoting most of their development time to the Linux Mint team. In fact, m during one of the last previous major updates, the Debian edition actually became the beta testers for Mint because they did their upgrade applet that let you graphically just click and upgrade your system from LMDE5 to LMDE6. Well, that same tool would make its way into when they upgraded from MIT20 to MIT21. Well, guess who beta tested that? The Debian edition folk. It's a smaller community, easier to develop for because it's Debian. And if you break someone's LMDE system, well, they're just going to reinstall it, you know, or you got time shift, it'll probably save you. Um, so, and maybe that's kind of down to it, is they don't put as much development time in the Debian edition. And I've had some quirks messing with the Debian edition, but I'm willing to put up with that. And I would assume that, like anything else, if they switched tooling and said, you know what, Debian edition's our main guy now, and they built their Mate desktop environment and their XFCE, you'd see a higher quality over there. Now, I'm not saying I run Debian edition and it blows itself up all the time just just weird quirks like anything else you know i've had fingerprint readers that just decide that they don't exist anymore or nvidia drivers that like my precision if i turn it on and it's not plugged in it runs in integrated graphics mode but if i plug it in and reboot it will load into nvidia dedicated mode i have yet to figure out why that's a thing that doesn't happen on the Ubuntu version because Prime and all that is just there and works. Well, um, but again, if Ubuntu they retooled... With, it, Ubuntu is much closer, you know, working with NVIDIA and stuff. Sorry. Yep. Um, yeah. Nope, you're fine. Uh, D-Dubs, go ahead. Just just briefly on the, on the Linux Mint Debian edition, when you go to downloads, it's right there. Oh, is it? 
It used yeah. to be in a drop down menu. Um, it is still. If you is, go to download, it, it says, "Hey, our current version is," and then right next to it is oh. other versions. That'd be an addition. Okay. So yeah. it's not as buried as it once was. Yeah, it seemed like it was. So, yeah, it's not front and center, but it's it's still there. It's not right. it's not like Endeavor OS, which buries all of their downloads. They don't have any <laughs> any yeah. downloads at all on the. We don't website. want you to take this unless you really, really, really <laughs> want oh, it. I got in so yeah. much trouble when it's I just asthma. It'll be fine. I, I love Endeavor OS, but getting the ISO oh, okay. is such a tedious process. It's oh. <laughs> almost, well, no, as, no. Okay, it was worse. almost as bad as Debian used to be. No, De- yeah. no Debian is still is Debian still, is still terrible. If you want like a testing yeah. or a SID or a, literally you know, anything, you don't really want SID, so we're not going to give it to you. Yeah. But before they updated their website, it was really hard to get the download link for. Even for the stable version, so well, and before they updated, before they decided to include non-free in the ISO, and like everyone needed non-free. Like you, you couldn't use Debian without the non-free. I mean, I mean, unless you're yeah. Drew, Drew, who's super Debian over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like everyone needed the non-free, and they buried that ISO like crazy, and it, it just drove everyone nuts. But uh, now that they include the non-free, at least now if you're going to. <laughs> Did he rage quit? <laughs> uh, um, no. Uh, it, it, you know, now that they've included the non-free, it's just you can download the thing right down the front page. But Endeavor like buries all of, like all of their download links on a, a set, another separate page. is really weird. Um, but a- anyways, I, I don't, I don't have a big issue. I I had a much bigger issue with with Linux Mint back when I first made that Linux Mint is useless video back in the day. And now that I've used it, Classic. like like yeah, I, I know. I, I just I, didn't give you crap for that. Like it's just funny at this point. I love that video. I had it's it remains the only video that I've ever had to turn comments off on because I was getting death threats. Like like like. <laughs> You Linux Mint guys are fucking loony. Like, absolutely. Literally loony. get wrecked, Matt. Um, <laughs> like, worse are Nick's OS guys. So, uh, oh, good yeah. lord. Sparkles so is still trying to convert me. There's a, reason, there's, OS. there's a reason why my Nick's OS review has not come out yet, because you guys ain't going to like it. Um, you know I, what, though? Bring it. It's like, it's okay. I, it, it's good. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, even when they're wrong. It's He's just going to delete his YouTube channel when it comes to the next video. It's just going to be gone. <laughs> this is like not for everybody, and it doesn't like. Hey. Yeah, I, I know. I, I I'm seventy five percent of the way through it, and Good. it's just you know, it, I'm fighting it because I like I I want to. <laughs> I, I talked about this in my uh, Patreon only podcast yesterday, where uh, like I'm seventy five percent of the way through it, but uh, like every time I do a little piece of it, I'm like like you know, what? I'm gonna have to start over again because this is shit. Um, Silent Bob, go ahead. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Bob, did you forget to unmute yourself? I think you did. Either that, you're yeah. Well, he's silent. <laughs> he's, he's exactly. I was like, what do, you, what do you expect? Is he just he's just through the hand signs, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I think what he's trying to do is flip me off, and then there's just no way to do it on the thing. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have... He, he lost all audio. We want to know that because like he's, he's still he's still muted. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. He just wrote that in the chat of this call. Oh, uh, I, I I kind of forget that the chat is actually a real thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Bob, we'll we'll just stop uh, picking on you now. Um, Maybe if you weren't on Slackware, you'd have actual audio support. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, he had me try Slackware, and I still haven't updated it, and it's been three months, and I've actually forgotten how Slack builds work. So it's even worse because now I have a system that needs like stuff fixed, and now I have to re-remember how Slackware works before I can even update yeah, the that's... system. I. I hate the Slackware way of doing things. It's like really it could be a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say it. There, I mean, there are worse, but 
I just are, don't know why. Are, are there? Could be NixOS. No, NixOS is not <laughs> I hate to be one to defend NixOS, but NixOS isn't actually worse than than. No, it's not terrible, and I get Matt where you, where you're frustrated because I have tried three or four times now to sit down and mess with Nix, and it's like if I could sit down and dedicate a couple hours at a time, I'm sure it would. I would eventually like do it. But because I can only dedicate like twenty minutes here, or twenty minutes here, I just get frustrated and just nuke the, nuke the VM or nuke the system, and then come back yeah. six months later and go, "I should do this again." My problem That's... with Nix isn't that it's a bad distro; it's a good distro. If you're just using the configuration file aspect of it, that's really really cool. You can take that thing and put it on all your machines; it works really really well. If you expand, even if you expand out to Flakes and and Home and Home Manager, all that stuff, it's excellent. My problem is a unique. YouTuber problem. I have to take that stuff and explain it to people, and I can't do it well. Um, and, and mainly it's because you Nix guys can't explain it to me either. A and well, some of you are better than others at explaining stuff, but you all explaining it, explain it in separate, different, little snowflakey ways. And I don't. It, it, it's taken me a long time to piece together like what is a flake? How can I actually do this thing? And 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 it, and once I figured out how to do it, you know, it was great. But now I have to take that and all the number of different explanations I've had in my head and try to explain it to someone else. And not only do that, but explain it to 50,000 other people. And th that's why I, I've, I've, I have not actually recorded a version of the flake explanation that I like. Because I've explained it probably six times in a separate thing and they're all slightly different kind of the you know correct and i i can't do it in a way that i like it's why it's taking it's why this is taking me so long i've been using nix now for almost a year like that's how long this long-term review has gone on for and i've I, I every little piece i've i've looked at it and like you know that is crap i have i didn't explain it well enough or i didn't explain it good enough or the number of times I've said in that video it, that I don't know what this means or how or what it does or how to explain it, any number of places where I, I just I've looked at it, a piece of content that I've made for this review and said, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know how this thing works or why this thing is that way, and when you've been using something for this long and you have that explanation. It, you know, it's not that great. It doesn't. It doesn't look great, and that has led me to have some, you know, phobia over actually publishing this thing. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, with NixOS, the issue is that you basically have to to explain how the Nix programming language works, and then this guy learns it this way. This guy learns it that way. It's not one learning curve. It can be multiple different learning curves and because of that a lot of people ha have learned it the other way because for example Zany, Zany did, did the virtualization stuff completely different than I did and I was like how does this even work because there are so many things I took for granted when setting it up for myself that he just didn't implement and yeah that's also a so huge case, issue yeah so case in point right at the beginning like something that you may want to do is install f like nerd fonts or whatever when you first start <laughs> right and there are at least at least three different ways in your configuration file in terms of syntax of installing a, a font you know mm -hmm. you can there's just at least three and there's probably more that i don't know and some of them are going to, you know, give you, will actually spit out errors if you do them. And, and it, it's kind of like, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of a correlation, but it's, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of like Gentoo. Like it, you're installing Gentoo and it, Gentoo works fantastically well if you install it linearly, linearly and follow uh, like one way of doing things. Like if you're going to do the EXT4 version of, of, of Gentoo and you follow that all the way through, you get 
uh, you, you have ext4 at the end of the day but it, it's or an even better example of of system uh non system d you're gonna you're gonna use open rc or whatever it is right you're gonna you're gonna end up with open rc at the end of the day but it, it, it that whole thing on NixOS is like halfway through the gen 2 install you switch from doing the open rc instructions to accidentally following the system d instructions you're not going to get a working system at the end of the day because you don't have those things that are working together and, and it's really weird now a lot of the times you can follow the two different types of syntax or three different types of syntax in nix and it will work just fine sometimes it won't and it's really really very very confusing to try to explain that to people what would help immensely is if there was good documentation on the NixOS side, where yep. I can just ignore what D-Dubs tells me, I can ignore what Jerry tells me, I can ignore what Zane tells me, because all three of them do things awesomely, but in different ways. But I can follow the documentation on the Nix website and say, this for sure is gonna work if you follow this, but it doesn't exist. War Thunder, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, and even like, we were talking about fonts earlier, and you're saying how Nix has like three different ways to specify that. Well, that's how Nix does it. It, and you know nix is almost one level more complicated than a traditional distro because now it's immutable so even in a traditional distro like open how many ways can you install fonts on open well i mean there's i mean you could probably sit here and label three four or five different ways of doing it or debian's probably got a couple different ways mint has at least three that i know of including just dragging the fonts into the font manager exactly or double clicking on a font like or, or dragging to the user share folder or yeah or yeah. in the package. There's one thing I think you're kind of missing is Nix isn't really a distro. Yes. Core. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> I got it recorded too. There's the. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Just that on loop is a GIF, Matt. On loop is a GIF. <laughs> yeah. It's a language. It, you could say in Python, Bash, C, I don't care what. How many different ways yep. can you do the same task? But the thing about Nix is over time, it has been expanded. And even within the Nix community, they don't all agree. Oh, I don't use Home Manager. Flakes, oh, oh, icky, oh, I don't use Flakes. I It should only be one configuration file, and that's it. So you have these different methodologies that have been I'm going to say it cobbled together and it's done as Jerry was saying, well, I do it this way. I would do it that way. And that is certainly not a traditional distro methodology. If you like open SUSE, you're going to, it's done this way. If you like Debian, it's done this way. Arch is done this way. So there's a very set, order of things based on the package manager right. so but now you've taken a package manager a language and thrown them together with both standard and experimental features and yeah you're going to get chaos well i'm so, going to say it the yeah. potential for that but you pick a method that works for you and you build something with it. And the same with any programming language. If you write a Python program, I guarantee it's gonna be different than the way I do. Yeah, right. The, the issue here, D-Dubs, isn't that there's not multiple ways of doing things on OpenSUSE, there is. It's just that the, if I want to install a font on OpenSUSE, it's the exact same way of installing a font as exists on Fedora and Ubuntu. They're mm -hmm. all the same. Yes, there's multiple different ways. They're all different. Right. No, no, I, I'm agreeing with you. But like I say, you're not, you're not really understanding that Nix is not necessarily designed to be an operating system. You could take C and build an operating system out of it. In fact, most of Linux is in C. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the utilities are in C. But there are so many ways within C to do the same thing. Oh, I'm going to link this assembly. Oh, I'm going to link this. I'm going to do this. And it's, you know, you the way you do it and the way someone else does it is very different. Its flexibility is its strength and its con. And the documentation, you are 10,000% correct. They are terrible about updating it's it. It's a meme. It's they, a meme at this point. Terrible. There are, what, three, four unofficial wikis? You know, okay. You're absolutely no argument there. But you learn the language 
and then you do it your way. There's plenty of users on the you know, uh, Tyler's Discord that thinks he's crazy the way he did it. He's doing it all wrong. Okay. You do it. And, you know, well, I'm not going to do it. Well, he did. And he gave us something that works. We laughingly call it Zany OS. And a lot of people who know Nick's go, well, that's wrong. And no, I would never do it that way. Okay. Well, you go build yours and I'll try it. You know, it's, it's, so trust me, your frustration <laughs> is well deserved. Yeah. <laughs> well recognized. You have to kind of love it and learn it. So that's why, that's, I, I don't think that's, gonna say, that's why when you dump all over Nick's, I'm not going to be even mildly annoyed. I don't think no. that I'm going to, I I mean, good memory. I'm like I said, I'm about 75% of the way through my outline. And I don't think that I've been overly negative in so much that I've been confused throughout the whole thing. And that confusion has, has like, like I've learned quite a bit of the Nick syntax. Right. And, and you're right. You're exactly right. It, it, it's very much comparable to, to Haskell or P Python. Like that there's tw like, Haskell is actually 10 million times worse. It's unfair to compare Nix to Haskell. But <laughs> but I, I think that Haskell does exhibit exactly the way Nix makes me feel. Because if you've ever used Haskell, you know that there's 12 different ways of doing things, and none of them work with the other ways of doing them. So mm -hmm. if you don't follow the exact way you've always done things, and you try to incorporate some of those other things, like there's you know four different ways of calling a, vari a variable in Haskell, and if if you don't you know call them the same all the time and have the corresponding syntax later on in the document actually meant to call that type of of variable, you're gonna have a problem right and, and that just showcased my very little horrible knowledge of haskell but you know i i think that if anybody's actually folk i mean like if dt was here he'd be he'd, he'd be pulling his hair out <laughs> i'm sorry i had to do it <laughs> but you know because he, he knows a lot more way more haskell than i ever will and and more fun to him i guess but uh, that's just the way that nix makes me feel and i uh, 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 and I, I, I always come. My, my, my biggest issue is that when I do these types of things, is that I come at it from the perspective of wanting presenting this thing to new users. And there's not a single case that I could ever argue that NixOS could be presented to a new user. Like you, you, you can make the argument to me that Gen Two is the perfect new user distro. I, I, in fact, I know some new to Linux users who actually have used Gentoo as their distro, their first distro. Uh, I, I couldn't ever foresee ever recommending NixOS to a brand new to Linux user. It just, no. I, I can never say that. No. And, and I think that I, I, I would say that that's the only distro I've ever encountered besides Linux from scratch, which isn't a distro. Um, that I could say that about. And, and maybe that's where, you know, now that I think about it, maybe that's the thing that I should compare it to is kind of Linux from scratch because neither one of them are distros. They both do things in different ways that no other distro is ever going to do. And, you know, you kind of, the only difference is where Nix has a workable system to begin with. You know, you can just install it from Calamari's if you want to. Um, and Linux from scratch, you can't. After that, you're still very much expected to... Get yeah. in, into the guts of the thing and, and make it your own. Yeah. Yeah, um, to build your own thing. Yeah. yeah. The Snowflake project is an attempt uh, to remedy that and build a user friendly Nix OS Nix OS based system. But it's you know very, very slow at this point, development wise. No, it's I, basically I agree. Dead. You know, it's um, it is definitely not for not for beginners at all. It's not for everybody because everybody doesn't like its benefits enough to suffer the pain of learning it. Now that I've got working systems and working configurations, it's like, this is amazing. But getting there uh, Took some time. Yeah, I, is, is I, definitely a challenge. I yep. remember and that's when the you, thing. When you started with NixOS, you told me NixOS will never replace Arco for you. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was like, I like it, but this is such a pain in the butt. Like, but now it's it's 
it's you know my main system so i run more of that than but now you've tailored it to yourself you've made it work for yourself yeah and that's kind of how i see a lot of these distros these days cuz i I've, I've hopped around a lot of people want think i started with mint i did not start with mint i started with ubuntu 1404 like i told jerry <laughs> um, I did Zorn OS, which was a dumpster fire on its own. Still kind of is, in my opinion. But I kind of went around the horn, and what I ended up finding is that a lot of these distros exist in their own niche, purely, one, because nobody can figure out how they want to do things. Everybody wants to do something a little bit different. But once you've found that hole that you want to be in, you just make it fit yourself like a tailored suit at that point. You know, if Nix works great for you and you like the language and you like how you can build that config file, or like how Zany has drawn just completely all out and whatnot, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. If you're born and you want your system to do a lot of things for you, well, NixOS isn't going to do anything for you. It's going to kick you out the back door and say, get yourself a job. Um, but, you know, it'll also teach you a lot about Nix. It'll just like arch will teach you a lot about how linux works it's gonna break it's gonna slap you in the face but that's okay because arch is there for the for the tinkers and whatnot nix is there for the nerds and whatnot that like to you know configure things a certain way and whatnot Mm -hmm. and i appreciate all of them at this point i really do um that's entirely arch is the one that me and i don't get along arch and Mm -hmm. i just like plasma and i have a really love hate relationship i'd love to love you but every time i show up you like shoot me in the foot bitch slapped me across the face and pushed me out the back door and it's just like why are you doing this to me i really want to be friends with you and that's how i've always so i've always been about that <laughs> yeah you know, and, and the thing with nicks it's funny you say that because one of the things that i like about it is it takes care of a lot of common problems you know the way packages are both handled as far as dependencies and how they're installed and managed it's one of the things that i actually appreciate the most about it versus what I've gone through in dependency hell and, you know, and, Oh, this conflicts with this, you know, I don't miss that. So, but you're exactly right. It works for me. And that's all that matters. Open Susie works for Matt. That's what yeah, I was going to say. The, the closest to uh, what you've experienced with Nick's is like how I've abused time shift on way too many occasions where I have gone and done something really terrible to my system. In fact, I did it the other day with the NVIDIA drivers. I had this brilliant idea. I was going to install the NVIDIA 390 drivers from either SID or I got it built. I'll just steal them from Debian 11. It'll be fine. And I made an absolute muckery of everything. Well, here's the thing. If I'm in Nix, right, and I want to try something stupid, I can go try something stupid because yeah. it has those snapshots. And so if you're somebody who likes to try out something new, you can try that something new and go, you know what, I didn't really like that. I don't really like how that worked out or whatnot. Let me just roll back. Yeah, I, And I, you can do that. You can tweak that. Yeah. I lost count on how many times I accidentally completely fucked up my configuration and then was like, thank God for the generation system. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, it is possible to break it. It is definitely yep. possible. Yeah. But, it is. Yeah, but I, I, I think you gotta try. There's a couple ways I found to do it. It's not too hard. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, for the most part, yes, you know, the, the generations really do really do save you. And but then so unlike like me, I have a bunch of bash scripts as I've learned bash and I'm starting to teach myself the code. So if I set up a system, sure, I'm up and running in twenty minutes to an hour because I have bash script to do everything. You don't even have to do that. If you've got your Nix configuration file, yeah. you've already put in the countless hours to figure all that out. You just move that thing over into the new system, rebuild switch, and you're done. Sure, you know you got to sit there and wait wait for things to build, but once it's built, you're done. Yeah, you just I mean, reboot and you're good to go. Yeah, and I've taken it with uh, using the Zany OS kind of approach. I've got all my hosts, and now I can. I can develop on one system. Typically, I use a VM, and then I I go and I put in the GitHub. I download it. I got the new code versions. I just copy the the options file for that host and its hardware, and I do a rebuild, and it's up to date. Yep. I like that. You know, there's there's like I say, there's a lot of good for it, but man, you got to work on it. Trouble it's so much done. easier than trying to do apt pinning. I learned a lot about apt pinning. It sucks. 
It does not work as you expect. And when your system comes across with 1,700 packages ready to update, and about, uh, I don't know, two to 250 of them is Cinnamon, uh, MDM Display Manager, uh, Nemo. We want to remove all these packages because we need to upgrade Python and these other things. Wait, why are you trying to uninstall my desktop environment? <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of cases where I've seen Nix is, oh, if I've messed up a config file, it spits at me, hey, that ain't that ain't cool, you can't do that, and it doesn't build. You still have a bootable system. Right. And Whereas even, if I have yeah. to update, goodbye, yeah. my system is now gone. <laughs> I don't need fancy configuration files because I have ButterFS. So, yeah. It's true. You use Snapper. Yeah, which is which, pretty again, good. which which is fine while that drive is alive. So, but unless you have also have an absolute backup of it yeah. of the boot drive, that's true. Uh, Trollbus, yeah. you kind of got moved on from. Did you still want to say what you were going to say? I'm sorry, I forgot to get your hands up. Oh, I just wanted to mention that uh, like the one thing that I found interesting about like Nix and GUIX and stuff like that with a config file is that if you want to grab like someone else's config, it's like really easy. It's like the one thing that's like like interesting about it, I think. Like same thing with like Zanio. I don't know much about it, but uh, I think that's, uh, you know, he's a uh, yeah, like uh, he was on the, on the on the log before, you know, and it's just his config, right? And anyone can use it. Yeah, it yeah. literally is. is that's is that's pretty cool. And you can then modify. It. Well, I mean, you could literally run his configuration by changing one file and running a command to generate the hardware config for your system that you're running it on, and build. And then you've got all of his packages, his configuration, his styling, wallpapers, everything. You have a duplicate of his system. You know, I, I like well, the example I like to give is I built a system with ext4, regretted it, and I saved off the config. I re, I did it, reinstalled the base OS, XFS, and I layered on my config. It took me about 20 minutes, start to finish. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, and imagine I guess, if it was as easy as just, like, like if everyone ha was, like, on Nix, which is clearly not going to happen. But, like, imagine if you could just, like, download, like, one thing off of, like, Unix porn, and you just have that. Like, imagine the new users, like, trying out cool stuff all day, you know? Like, that, that that's, that's like, the one thing that I find, like, interesting. I have... Uh, uh, the thing about is, desktop environments. They're making yeah, it seem well, easier, servers, though, everything. than what it actually is, because it... Okay, so if you're if you're using Nix and you find someone else who uses Nix, yeah, that's great. I, I, I'm really happy for you guys. It is really cool. And, and, yeah, you can pull that configuration file down and do what you want to do. But, man, it has the same problem that I had with Elementary OS back in the day. Is where when, when a lot of developers started developing apps for Elementary OS, and it was really kind of messy to get them to work and look good on other, you know, distros. Nix kind of has that problem where, like, if, if I find some a, a Unix porn thing that I want to use on OpenSUSE, it's great if they don't use, you know, Home Manager and Nix OS. Because if they do, that means all their dot files are in Nix, and that means getting all the stuff that you need is still there it's just kind of you have to pull all the nix shit out and actually in order to use it now that's that's a nix not being a linux distro problem <laughs> and not a you know a, a traditional problem and not something that a lot of people are going to face but it feels like it i i think and this is going to be an argument that i make in the in in the review no matter whether or not i restart over or not it nix it isn't that Nix is bad. Nix is fantastic. It's really, really good. It has a lot of really good ideas. It's poorly documented, but that's not a uniquely Nix problem. N documentation is shit all over the, the Linux ecosystem. It's just developers are really Nix is bad. Nix is more at, complicated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Nix is just, an, it, it stands out more with Nix because Nix really needs documentation. Whereas if the, the documentation for NeoFetch is bad, who cares, right? It's just NeoFetch, right? It's, you know, yeah. you know so. it's, it's worse than that. It's, a, it's the, if you were running C or learning C or Python or any language and the documentation sucked. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so my my argument, my one of the things I'm going to say, it, it just is that NixOS has it's an, it's an outlier, and because it does literally everything differently, 
it, it, it is the equivalent of Apple's walled garden. Like once you get in, you're going to be as happy as, you know, a chicken on a hot summer day. You're going to you're going to be very, very happy in there if, if you get it. If, if, Unless you're Jerry. Right, right. Like if you get into Nix and you absolutely understand it, and you build your configuration file, and you become Zany 2.0, you're gonna be awesome, you're, and you're gonna live there. But if you decide you're gonna leave, like if you decide for whatever reason a year down the road, yeah, you've already done all this work, but for whatever reason Nix OS isn't going to work for you all that well, taking your stuff and going, depending on how you've done things, and, and that's a big qualification because if you've done things just like. At one point, I don't know if if Tyler still does this or not, but he has he had all of his just configuration files in a folder, or whatever, and it was really easy to get the stuff out of there. I don't know if it's still the case or not, but and you can do that with Home Manager, but some other people are are much more complicated with Home Manager, and it's much more integrated with the Nix you know language and stuff like that, right? So depending on how you've done stuff, it could be supremely hard to get your stuff out of there and go. And also, it's not, not even really getting your stuff out. It's just that you've spent an entire year doing things the Nix way. Going back to doing things the traditional Linux way is going to... It, it'd be like... You've used... Okay. Hold you've, on. You've, 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 I got to cut you off. You've used QWERTY your entire life, and then you switched over to Dvorak basically do the same thing but they're different layouts right and then all of a sudden you've used Dvorak for a year and you come back to use QWERTY it's going to take you a little bit of time to reacclimate into the system uh, go ahead D-Dubs you're going to tell me that I'm wrong I'm going to well I'm going to clarify something you're not wrong but you're missing a couple of pieces of information one for example I run you know ja, ja Rule ja Cool's kit his dot files I use his dot files straight out on a Nix OS base. So you can do it kind of the quote unquote traditional way. The second point is you're right. If I try to take my Nix configured files and transport them, I've got to do that some sort of extraction. However, those files, those config files, they're in sim links, but you can still read the contents and return them into standard config files. Oh yeah, you could so just then then you could make it running. very portable. So you would have, I've done it because you take the contents and cut it out to a file, but, but, and then you end up back with. So you can take the outputted file in the dot config directory and regurgitate that back into a standard layout and take it with you. So you don't have to literally go into Nix and strip it all out. You can so is it gonna get everything there's probably a few things like with 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 potentially with some shells and things that might be a little harder, but you can take the vast majority with you without having to you know, start from scratch. Right. And and and, and that works on an individual level, but when you're trying <laughs> Uh, another thing that I, I talked about is like when, when you are sharing that with other people who don't necessarily use mm -hmm. Nix. It's, right. Because no, right. those 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 soft links are, aren't coming along when you upload right, stuff. No, right, GitLab, I, right, right. Not. I, I'm agreeing with you. Um, That's why I said I didn't say you were wrong. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. You were talking about a specific situation of I went to the walled garden. I decided mm -hmm. I've got to escape. You know, I don't want it. I want, I want the pillow over my head, the way of getting out. You know, I, I want to leave with everything. Um, he, then it's he, then, yes, it is possible to do without starting over from scratch. But your, you know, your point is, is correct. Jerry, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I have a perfect example of one thing that could not get b ported back into traditional dot files and that's ZanyOS's NeoVim because ZanyOS's NeoVim is basically perfect for me and I re very recently I figured hey I want to have it on my Mac too mm -hmm. and so I tried to port the soft links over and it did not work at all why because the ZanyOS's NeoVim folder has the, has that plugins folder and they, I had no idea that they existed. So what did I end up doing? Right, I wrote a Mac-specific flake that contained nothing but the NeoVim configuration. So I basically had to 
use the NexOS way with Home Manager right. to manage my NeoVim for me. Yeah. I, okay, yeah. now it, now it's basically my entire terminal and half of my home directory because why not? But the the reason why I started doing that in the first place was because I could not, for the love of all that's holy, get that shit to work on macOS. Yeah, and no, like so, said, I, I did say you know I said the you know the vast majority of of things that you're going to be able to to transport without having to to you know decompile them if you will and know. the thing is is like a, a, uh, uh, a yes you can go through and do that and you you, you said you go just go through a process and you can and easily pull those sim links and stuff like that but that's a process that doesn't really exist on any other distro if you if, if i want to take my mm -hmm. my hyper mm -hmm. hyperland stuff out of open susa and move it over to fedora i just take the folder pop it over there it's going to work right and, and that's not it's not a problem so much as it's just the way things are right like because nix is just the, the, i'm gonna give away the entire review nix is different like it, it's not uh, my 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 most viewed youtube short is a distro is a, is a short called nix os is not a distro it's it's a it's a clip from a podcast that Tyler and I did. And basically we were I was just basically we were just arguing that it's so different it can't really qualify as a distro. And then everybody in the comments was like, well does it use the Linux kernel? Are the GNU core utils there? Like yeah, okay, fine. Yes. Uh technically those things do exist, which therefore okay fine is Linux distro. But it's so different in every other regard that it makes it really hard to say uh, you can go through and learn Linux. Like, like it, you can be the biggest Arch user you've ever seen, or you, the 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 most Gen two of Gen two users, and know literally everything there is about the you know the root file system and compiling software and all that stuff. None of that knowledge, or very little of that knowledge, feels like it's transferable over to Nix. And part of it is what you said dubs is because that's it nix isn't an, an, an operating system it's a language it, yeah. it, if all of linux was a language it'd be similar but not quite from moving to c to python like you, you c and python share very little in terms of syntax if anything at all but you can still understand you know you know variables exist in both places right and classes and you know if statements you know you both of those things happen in almost every language under exists they are syntax differently in different languages but you can at least understand like an if statement behaves or, you know not behaves but an if statement means the same thing in python as it does in c right you they're both if statements if this is true then do this whereas you yeah. know like I, I, that um, it, it's really hard to say you know you have all of this linux knowledge you you spent probably 20 years or whatever using linux exactly like, like and then you go and use nix it's completely yeah. different you have to Absolutely. basically start yeah. off from the beginning and that's yeah. been my problem trying to explain this thing from a linux user's perspective like yes technically this thing uses the linux kernel but it's not the linux you grew up with you know it's just completely different so yeah yeah that's it, not your that, father's linux yeah Let, let's take I'm the gonna steal that for the title <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the if. That's, that's the title. Yes. That's the tagline for your review. I'm writing it down. Make Please. your daddy's Linux. Just <laughs> upload a 10 second video. That, that's it. <laughs> no context. <laughs> yeah, and, but that's completely true. I mean, let's take the if statement as an example. On bash, it's if variable equals true, then do this. On C, same thing. But on NixOS, I actually only learned it because Zany used it in ZanyOS. It's basically like lib dot make if this equals equals true, and then yeah, do your stuff. And it's but, yeah, it, like you say, it's it is definitely not you the know, core. In the standard. 
there there is a correlation here when it comes to languages actually and it is haskell like haskell has weird ways of doing things like you know it has you know uh opening and close greater than signs with a plus in the middle or whatever and that means a certain thing you got the question mark which basically means put everything before it in a in in parentheses or whatever you have double dots and things that go all over the place if you're coming from like python and you're trying to go learn haskell uh you're going to be a little lost. Yes, it, ha it still has if statements and classes and all sorts of stuff. But because there's these little weird things that the Haskell guys have chosen to do because for whatever reason they hate parentheses, um, <laughs> which which is weird because you can still actually use parentheses in Haskell. So I've never really understood their uh, needing for something else to do parentheses. It's been really weird for me. But, you know, th that's kind of the thing. Like you go there and there's these extra things that don't really exist in any other language. The only other language that really does some weird things with parentheses and stuff is Lua, and even then, not really, right? Like it's not, it's not exactly the same. Um, so I, I don't know. My my, I'm about eighty percent sure that I'm going to be starting the NixOS thing over, which is going to piss everyone off who's been waiting for it because I've I've been promising it forever, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm ever going to put out anything that I'm going to be very very happy with. But I, I'm almost 100% positive what I have so far is a disjointed mess because I started recording like fully like I've been using it for a year, but I started recording in November. It is July and I'm like <laughs> I, I record a three minute piece of it. And you, you know, if that's good enough, then I'll move on to the next three-minute piece, and I'll, you know, like I'll, I, like I've done the gaming piece because the gaming piece was really easy because it was basically the same as any other thing. I just installed Steam and played some games. It worked fine, um, you know. But then I get to the NixOS specific stuff, and I've, I've done the, the flake thing at least five times, maybe even more. I, I, I haven't even tried home manager to try to you know explain what home manager is and how to use it i haven't got there yet i don't even know if i'll include home manager in the thing like that's how far away i am from actually you know being able to explain home manager like i have the the general gist of it but the words coming out of my mouth haven't i haven't got that far yet and i don't know if i will be able to get there that's one of the reasons why yeah, you want to be able to convey it well i i can't have a three-hour review come out of this thing that so that's number one it has to be like at well, least like 30 minutes or less is where, where i'm aiming but also it can't come out and so just it can't come out so disjointed that none of it makes more sense uh, the, you, and the stuff that i have right now you can really tell that my knowledge of nix has grown a lot from those little clips in december to where i am now like i understand stuff way more now because i'm you know i talk to d-dubs i talk to tyler about stuff and you know and, and i find like you mentioned three unofficial whip wikis d-dubs there's more than three right there's so there's some people who just you know, there, <laughs> that's there, there, true there are a lot of nick's yep, users yep. who have decided to say like the, they're it's obvious that they're never going to get the the, the documentation right so screw it i'm doing my own and yeah. so the, the number of github repositories out there that have some level of documentation for nicks is higher and i've read some of through some of those and that's helped me understand some of the stuff but again they're not you know a lot of them aren't compatible because they're all doing things it's very confusing and that's one of the reasons why this thing has taken a year and one of the reasons why you know i was like you know, screw it i'm not doing it at all i've done it i've quit several times and, and then alexi gets on the discord and said matt where's the this where's the nix os review he's, he's <laughs> my personal nix os troll and he doesn't even use nix os he's a debian user <laughs> So, I, I have a problem. These ones they see, Matt said I mean, it's terrible. So yeah. don't use it. I was yeah. right all along. I mean, I, if I could give you just the three second answer to what Home Manager is for me, is just manages my doc files in my doc config. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I get the purpose behind it, and, and I've even used it a little bit, but I'm very weary of it. Also, I haven't. Nick, so, so you guys probably heard on, on the podcast how I've had a little bit of a, of a struggle trying to figure out what I'm going to use in terms of a, a desktop environment. NixOS has gone along on that journey with me. Um, and while it has been extraordinarily easier to switch between GNOME and KDE and Hyperland on Nix, because it's just a, you know, a single line, uh, it's still, I've, I, I've, had a, I've had a much harder time uh, doing the home pan manager thing because I haven't stayed on one thing long enough that can 
configure stuff inside of Home Manager to make it even worthwhile. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm still iffy on uh, Home Manager will get a mention. I don't know how much of it's actually going to make it into the review or not. We'll see. Yeah. How it goes. I mean, I would, I'm just saying that's what I would actually say if you want to say about Home Manager. That is, you <laughs> really don't have to go much more than that. To yeah, say, it's not a tutorial. It's just a review. Just well, yeah. I'm definitely using that it. title. Like, like not your days Linux. That <laughs> is definitely getting used. Um, I hope so because I was I just like I think that would be awesome. Because it's but true. I the desktop environment problem. I really do. Having been around the block a few times, it's it's it it sucks. It really does because GNOME is one of those you know it doesn't tend to break, but it's extremely boring. And if you want a feature, it probably doesn't have it, or you need an extension to make it work, um, which then will break GNOME every time it updates kde yep. is the one like i said i have a love-hate relationship much like me and arch we always try to murder each other for whatever reason and with kde it's never like 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 i think matt it's either matt or somebody i was watching went on this little tirade about how it's never a major like kwin blowing itself up or anything it's always these little, little things paper cuts, like yeah. icons in the wrong place mm -hmm. or the cursor which apparently now can just be as large as you want if you just keep shaking it um just like just like that was so great on birdie's video i'm sorry that was great um because i run the extension on cinnamon that does the same thing except it limits the size anyway um, it's always a bunch of little things, and so over the course of a day, I'll have used KDE and go, this is why I don't use KDE, and then I nuke and pave and, and move on to something else. But, like, to be honest, as far as pushing technology forward, KDE, to me, has done it the best with Wayland as far as my personal experience with scaling and all that. Um, but I've been on Mate. It's not bad um, and whatnot. I've like, if I didn't have Cinnamon, I'd probably be XFCE, I'm not going to lie. Um, my experiences on XFCE, especially on low-end hardware, fantastic. The only issues I've ever had was screen tearing, and that's a pretty easy fix. And that's mostly an X11 problem. So yeah, that's... I, I've been around, I've tried a bunch of them, and it's just like, if me and KD could get along, it would be great. But until that day, Cinnamon is the closest GDK equivalent, except it's a lot more heavily tested. and it has a, Yeah, it has less features. But it's also still very customizable, and I can still do whatever I want with it, for the most part. And it why, pretty much seems to hold up. While not offering, like, 10 billion settings. When the yep. first time I tried out KDE, I opened up system settings, and I was like, uh, huh? Yeah, and then you can search and whatnot. And, you know, yeah, the system settings pane in Cinnamon... Literally looks like Mac OS from like 2005 control, like their settings panel and whatnot. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the like, I'll be honest, when I do get around to messing with Nix, much like uh, the, I did finally reinstall my uh, test laptop with Arch. I put Endeavor OS on it for fun. Um, I put Cinnamon on it. I finally just decided, you know what? Arch has literally exploded in my face so many times. And I usually use KDE because that's usually what I want to do. Um, I'm going to say with Nix. I'm going to say, you know what? There's a way in Nix to run the Cinnamon desktop. I'm going to do that. Someday I wouldn't mind playing with a window manager. Maybe that'll be Hyperland. Maybe not. My brain, I feel like, is too small to figure out a tiling window manager. Like, I've seen people do it. They look great. They make a lot of sense, especially on, like, if I'm on a laptop or something like that, to have multiple desktops. Like, I played with Sway. That was pretty cool. Um, until Manjaro decided to ignite itself into flames. Um, that's the same thing. Um, but it was too bare bones for me, if that makes sense. Whereas, I feel like Cinnamon is the other way around, where it feels fully polished and fully featured, even if I don't use all the features. Okay, so as someone who used to be into tiling window managers like crazy, like you guys know me, like that's what I've made my meat and potatoes yeah. for a long time, right? And, and then there's been this last three months where I've moved back into desktop environments for the first time in a few years. And one of the, the thing that I will say is that, and the biggest difference that you're going to come up with it is, is that, well, I mean, tiling window managers are kind of like Nick's. You have to build that shit up for yourself. Every, and, mm -hmm. and it's, every little piece right and, and like for example here in kde or in gnome i have a a knob on my keyboard 
changes the volume perfectly it works perfectly fine in kde and gnome xfce all the desktop environments you go into a window manager it doesn't work at all like not at all uh it's it's stupid it should work <laughs> but it doesn't you you have to do something special in order for it to actually get it to work because basically what it's doing is it, it's control on the desktop environment it knows to control the default input mm -hmm. or output for your your sound on the desk or on in window manager it doesn't know what source you're trying to control um and that's just that's just one example and, and the thing is, is that now i've been on desktop environments now for a few months since may 5th or something like that i started using gnome and then i transitioned just a couple days ago back into kde i i tried mid during that whole midlife crisis that i was going through um switching back and forth five or six times when an hour it seemed like one of the things that i noticed when, when i was using hyperland was there are there are little niceties that you have in a desktop environment that you don't get in a window manager and you miss them things like mm -hmm. the, the, the volume working the way that you're expecting it to work things like uh having the portal actually pop up uh, just one time in uh, OBS because it will remember those after that first time like it will remember what you're doing in a desktop environment but in a window manager it won't remember it'll ask you every time and, uh, and here's the biggest one pull kit right in a, in a desktop mm -hmm. environment pull kit just works you know either you're using the KDE pull kit or you're using you know GNOME pull kit whatever in a window manager you have to have that thing running you know by yourself because you have to make sure it's starting and Every distro, no matter what, has their pull kit in a different place. And because it's not in a path, like a normal fucking piece of software, you know, you have to go searching out for that path in order to make sure you have it started. And uh, good luck finding it because it's going to be different everywhere. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, same same thing for me. I, I Recently, I installed NexOS again to help Tyler with ZenOS again. Then I got back into Hyperland and I was like, I know Aqua on macOS has some really bad quirks, but even macOS's desktop has some niceties that I really miss in Hyperland. Stuff like the volume knob, I mean, that's fixed because all, all that knob does is basically press an imaginary key keyboard button and but other than that I really got used to desktop environments ag again and if I weren't helping Tyler here and there on ZenOS I would be running like GNOME or KDE or XFCE if they finally release the Wayland version that's going to be a few years from now, and you can count on that. It's it, it's going to take them a little while. Now, yeah, surprisingly, so like, they have a roadmap. They all have roadmaps. I was going to say, uh, but, but, yeah. has a roadmap. That, 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 that takes like woods, five right? seconds in a readme. It doesn't take it. Like, well, like, yeah, we're doing Wayland. <laughs> That's their roadmap. Yeah. Um, we saw how Cinnamon's initial attempt at Wayland is we turned the button on. And then people log in. Well, why did it crash? It's because all they did was turn the button on, guys. Like, we're amazed we made it this far. Right. So, so <laughs> the, the surprising thing is, like, Cinnamon's made it fairly far, like, even beyond just turning the button on. Yeah. Mate says that they're done. Like, if you go to the if you go to the Mate roadmap for Wayland, really? it says that they're done. All they have to work on is Mason, um, which why well, I, I don't know what the correlation is between Mason and, and Wayland the, is. The thing with Mate is, at least if I remember correctly, all they did is basically strip out the old window manager and put Wayfire in its place. Uh, it's possible. I don't. I I I, I know it's that. Um, legit. I know that Martin Wimpress is no longer doing the project. Maybe so it's in completely different management. So whatever they did, I I don't know. I haven't used Mate in in forever, so I, I don't know what's going on. All I know is that the roadmap says that they're done. Uh, the XFC roadmap, they have some things done. Surprisingly, uh, they work on things and they just kind of whittle away at it, just like XFC always has and probably mm -hmm. always will. And that, I love it. I love that about XFC. But if you're looking at XFC as like, oh, that's going to eventually happen pretty soon, yeah, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. No. It's, it's 
it's going to be a couple years. Like, it, like I'm pretty sure, like, m m maybe uh, someone else can correct me, but I'm pretty sure it's just, like one or two guys that do XFC. That's it. Like, they don't have this grand team. Like, C like Cinnamon has the entire Met team behind them. Like, yeah. there, there's a whole True. Team. Officially, I think Cinnamon only has, like, three or four people officially, but there's a lot of community yeah. involvement. Plus, it's just, like, one or two guys... Plus, they did it the X11 way for forever, basically. And now they have to adapt their knowledge to Wayland, mm -hmm. which also takes a bunch of time. Yeah, it's, it's going to yep. take a, I, I, we, Everyone was astonished when they said the next version is going to have uh, Wayland support. But what they didn't take in account is the next version may not come for a few years. They, they, they've done that before, though, where there was, like, between version 4, about 12 and 4.14 or something like that. I may have the numbers wrong. Yeah. There was several years in between those things. Like, like the, the, the main developer or whatever had to go do a, a different job for a while. Um, and, you know, that, so that's happened before with XFC. Uh, the thing is, XFCE seems to be like everyone's default desktop environment. Like everyone says, like, oh yeah, I'm using Plasma, but uh, XFCE is my backup. Like that, that's everyone says that, um, and I'm the exact same way. Like I have XFC as my well, backup. I'd definitely be. I, it's actually my favorite desktop environment, but I hardly ever use it because the other ones are more shiny. Um, uh, War Thunder, go ahead. Well, I was going to say too. One of the things that XFCE and, you know, I, I see the Mint team do it a lot. Um, I've seen other projects do it. Things don't hit the stable branch until they're ready. So even if Mate finished all of their Wayland stuff, if they don't feel that it's ready for the users and they need a little bit more testing, they're just going to wait and delay that release. Um, Cinnamon's done that more than once. Like Mint was... If you followed like the Mint release schedule, it technically should have released two like two months ago. It should have released a month or so after Ubuntu, and they delayed because they had other stuff going on, other projects they were working on. And in fact, the Cinnamon desktop actually released a new version before Mint actually put their ISO into testing, which never usually happens. Usually, the desktop environment releases about the same time as the beta ISO, but they felt like the Cinnamon desktop was ready, so they went ahead and released it. The ISO in beta, it ain't ready yet. Apparently, it's had problems, so they delayed it. And I feel like XFCE does the same thing. If a feature's not ready, they go, ah, we'll put it in the next version when it's ready. Yeah, well, and then they're not beholden to any release schedule at all. Whereas, like, Ubuntu, they pretty much, I mean, there's been exactly, one, I think, one version of Ubuntu where they had to release a couple months earlier. It was, like, what, like... Mm -hmm. 10.06 or something like that. No, nope. nope. that was Ubuntu 6.06. .06. That's it. Exactly. I, I knew it was an 06. I knew that they had to go back yeah. to two months, right? Like, that's the only one. And, and, and yeah, they've moved it back a few days, but Canonical is very tied. Delayed 24. <laughs> yeah, they're very tied to their release schedule. Fedora, not so much. Fedora will say if they have a, a game breaking bug, they'll push oh, yeah. it, they'll push yep. it back. Um, but yep. Fedora is also yep. very much more on the bleeding edge of stuff. It's not really a rolling release, but they get a whole bunch of new stuff. Like you know, they got the Wayland and the the System D and all that stuff, all that before everybody else. Yep. And so stuff breaks. Yeah, right? the... I mean, they're even going to pull X11 from the repo sooner than everybody else, which is forty one. Well, and, and yeah. you guys saw the thing today where the GNOME 47 will have the ability for this maintainers to basically say that GNOME can compile without X without X11 now, like completely, like which so then so that's before even before um, Fedora is doing it, so it, which makes sense because they're going to have to have it set before Fedora can do their whole thing. So kind of wild. The dex the death of X of of X11 is nigh like like it's it's here uh yep. and you guys know me like i was i made a video saying you're gonna pry this thing from my cold dead hands i said that uh, you might pry for mine like, like like it definitely that those are definitely words that passed through my mouth and here i am i'm using wayland and i'm at the point now where it, it would be not impossible but very uh not nice to have to go back and actually use XOR. And it's not because Wayland is awesome and Wayland has no bugs and, you know, nothing oh, ever no. goes wrong in Wayland world. That's definitely not true. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is, like, I was a dumbass and I got this monitor that has a different screen resolution than my main monitor. And yep. well, X11 can handle that. It doesn't handle it well. Well, uh, it doesn't like it. 
It, 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 does, it, it doesn't like well, yeah. I'll give you a good example, Matt. I have a I downgraded my monitor setup to two monitors instead of three um, because I was hurting my neck looking up because I had a vertical above and then I had one off to the side. Now I just have a, a pair and they're both 27 inches and it's great, except one of them. I run them both at 1440p. One's my old 4K LG. I just run it at 1440p. It looks fine. But the Asus that I have in front of me is a 144 hertz gaming monitor. I can't run it at 144 hertz because I'm on X11 because it'll run at 60 because my other monitor is only 60 hertz. It's yeah. all it's supports. Same thing for me. My right monitor is a 1080p 60 hertz one. This monitor I'm looking at That's you really guys for me. is 1080p 144 hertz. And, well, it and won't we... really run at 144 if the other one's at 60. It will tell you it does, but it does not. It will still refresh at 60. Now, yeah. you could get around that by turning off the other monitor, and then it will run at 144 hertz or whatever. It, but I can definitely tell I'm running at 144 There, hertz. There is on one monitor. option they added in back in like 2019 or so that's called Async Flip Secondaries. Then yeah. you can run two different refresh rates, but then I tried it because... But it doesn't like it. I did not want to give up on awesome window manager, but the issue was that my 60 hertz monitor was screen tearing like crazy. Even even browsing the web was basically unusable, and 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 if I don't turn it on, my left monitor, my 144 hertz one, I mean it runs at 60 hertz. Even if I set it to 60 hertz. It feels like it's running at, at, um, it feels like running at five FPS. Yeah, and yeah, you'll have stutters and and whatnot. I so yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for Cinnamon on Wayland for those reasons, and I have things like this laptop. I will freely admit, fractional scaling on X11 might as well not be a feature. It's really bad. There's screen tearing. Even if you get rid of the screen tearing, there's lag. I've been there. Uh, even on Cinnamon, there were some really strange bugs where you'd close the lid on your laptop and go to sleep, and you'd wake up, and the display scaling would not understand where it's supposed to be, so it would just pick a number. Sometimes it would go to 100%, sometimes it'd be at 200%, sometimes you'd have to log in at a black screen. Um, it it, it okay. wouldn't know, versus, now it will crash, but if you log into Cinnamon Experimental Wayland and set the um, fractional scaling, it works perfectly fine. There's no screen tearing. There's no issues. KDE does the same thing. It works beautifully. I look forward to that because this laptop at 1080p at, at 15 inches, and I've got some other ones. As I've gotten older, and I know I'm not in my 30s yet, but my eyes aren't as good as they used to be even uh -huh. at this point. <laughs> I appreciate a slightly larger font and a little more scaling uh -huh. to hit the buttons. Mm -hmm. I currently cheat by editing the GTK SSS, GTK CSS, if I can English. And I set the header bar GDK to some really crappy values so the buttons can be hit more easily by myself on the trackpad when I'm out and around and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I would love just fractional scaling to just work. <laughs> so I don't have no, to I hack it. So, so you, you poor young little whippersnapper. <laughs> but you, <laughs> when, after you get past 30, it gets worse. It just goes down a hill and then you get to 40 and Dude. then it just keeps going um i have been accused of being a 40 year old in a 20 year old's body i'm just saying well, well they they say you are you gen are you late millennial or early gen z <laughs> uh technically be late millennial all right well you, you, we're just gonna i don't identify with my generation <laughs> screw those people but <laughs> just so just as long as you don't piss off the gen x guys you know <laughs> <laughs> there we go at, they'll come at us all they right. probably use good anyway uh, no, those are the Slackware users. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Gen X guy is over there just shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> the one guy who used FFmpeg to join this call. <laughs> oh, that's that's back in my day. <laughs> no, there's no there's no way he'd actually use FFmpeg because then his lips would be out of sync. We tried that, and it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and anyways, um, all right. So I think that's where we're gonna uh, end this one for for now, the guys. We had a, I think we had a fantastic conversation. We didn't piss anybody off. 
uh, Drew did respond. He did not rage quit, which is good. <laughs> I was a little worried because I made a Debian joke and then he quit. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> it wasn't that bad of a joke. It was a bad joke, but it wasn't like I'm going to piss all the Debian people off. But anyways, that's it for this one. Uh, for those of you who are watching the the, the recording of this, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, don't comment in the comment regarding the audio quality because we're all going to have various audio qualities war thunder's audio was atrocious just just let you know because <laughs> yeah. he's definitely using the microphone on his laptop I, and we can all tell uh, <laughs> i i had to set his volume down to 30 percent i didn't change so it i didn't change it at all so you guys are just gonna have to suffer <laughs> i blame for I had to dial <laughs> down do. so he doesn't blast my ears. <laughs> yeah, I had it. I, He's still I had sibilant to... for some reason. Yeah, he he's very sibilant. Yeah, he's he definitely he sounded like Voldemort there for a little while with the S's. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's it for this one. Uh, we for those of you guys again who are watching this later on, we do two lugs every month, one in the morning, one in the, in the after in the evening, uh, on different thursdays during the month you can find those exact dates by doing joining the discord server which will be in the video description below uh and if you can't catch us and can't be here uh, even if you know you can still be here and not actually talk you saw a couple people here who have been muted the entire time they're just here listening uh thank you guys for joining us as well that you, you if you want to you can do exactly that if you want to just like be in the audience or you can catch it on youtube later on because i usually do record these sometimes i stream them we didn't have a great turnout for the first one this month, so I didn't stream it because I thought I was just going to be sitting here in a room alone for the first half an hour, which is exactly what happened the first time. So, uh, But we had a great turnout this time, so uh, that's it for, uh, for me. So uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. I will uh, talk to you guys in, in the next one. Take care, guys.